Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest webinar from OAC Software, the Software House of Arab. Uh, for the next 45 minutes, we will take a look at our GSA software for uh, analysis and design of bridges. And you can see how GSA can help you design bridges for both vehicles and pedestrians. Uh, you will be steered through the webinar by myself, Nick Nicknam, technical sales consultant at OAC Software, and my colleague, Peter Depney, who is our technical specialist. The main agenda for, for today's webinar will primarily be to view our GSA bridge software and investigate its capabilities for bridge analysis and design. We will now move to GSA bridge uh, webinar. And uh, at this point, I want to ask Peter to continue the webinar and uh, I will answer your questions later. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Nick. Okay. So, um, as Nick says, we're looking at um, GSA Bridge. Now, um, in slightly more detail, we're looking at modeling, influence lines, bridge loading, optimization, envelopes, buckling, footfall analysis, and a few examples of where GSA Bridge is used um, at the moment. So, uh, bridge modeling first. Now, it has been said that um, di the difference between br bridges and buildings is that buildings are complex structures with simple loads, but bridges are simple structures with complex loads. Um, okay, this is. I've seen some quite complex bridges, I must admit, but um, in generally, in general, it's true. Uh, bridge loading, the complexity is mostly in, in in the loading. So we'll see how GSA can help um, keep that complexity under control for you. GSA uses um, typical road type concepts for defining both the bridge and 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 the loading, and um, and I shall show you how these are all used in the modeling. Um, so let me start GSA. What I'm going to do, apart from starting a new file, is just to say <coughs> that if bridge options are not um, showing on your gateway here, you'll need to make sure they are set in the preferences um, and make sure they are activated here. Right now, first thing to do is we need to find a grid plane. To find the grid plane, we need an axis. So I'm going to create an axis set, which I'm going to call um, road and this could be a Cartesian or a cylindrical axis. I'm going to start with the Cartesian axis. I'll have the origin at the, the global origin, just for simplicity. But rather than going parallel to the x vector, I will have it going in sort of a, uh, a 1 in 4 angle up. But the x, y vector will just indicates the direction of the, um, the y plane, or the x, y plane. I'll just leave that as default. And so if we switch on the user axis, we can see that yeah. It's it's rotated from 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 the global origin. I'll now use a grid plane. Now this, so the grid plane um grid plane is very important to bridge loading because you need this to actually or all all the bridge loads will be on on this plane, which I'm going to call deck, and the axis is going to be based on this one I just created. Elevation at that zero ele elevation, but we can use a different elevation from there. Um, element list by default, I'll take all elements, but if in your bridge deck you've got some plan bracing, you can choose to exclude that plan bracing. From this the grid plane to make sure that, that that the vehicle loads do not impact directly on the cross bracing, which uh, most cross bracing will be quite undesirable. 
and we're doing a grillage. Um, we can set it one way. This 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 bridge will be curved and everything, so just keep things simple. Set the two way um, grillage span, which means any load will distribute onto all the surrounding beams. If we define our current grid now, and just switch that on, say deck. And display this. You can see that um, our, our 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 current grid is now this grid plane, and we are rotated from the origin. Now let us um, add in some nodes. Now I could do this graphically, or I could I just um, I'm going to type in. Yeah, we we, you know, we can type the nodes in. Or in fact, let's let's see the nodes down there. I can copy this node. Let's say two copies, one to three meters. So these are the um, definitions for the grillage. So there are our nodes, and let me just join those up with elements. And these these are going to be the cross members on the bridge. Now the cross members, I'm going to make those property 2. I haven't defined property 2 yet, but th this is going to be my slab. And then I'm going to take those beams and I'm going to extrude them along the alignment, which I will define. So the alignment, let's call this rows, the alignment will be... Um, if the chainage starting from this point here, so it's set zero, and we can set the alignment being straight or curved, left or right. And I'll set it on a right curve to begin with, with a radius of 50 meters, and on that deck, on that grid plane. And then the next chainage, say 25 meters long, again also a right, and I have it the same radius, which means the first 25 meters we've got a constant radius. Then at 50 meters, I'll add a transition into a left hand curve with a 100 meter radius. So we've got a transition between right to left. And then finally, at 90 meters, which will be the length of our bridge, um, again, a left curve of 100 meters. Now to display this, I'll go to my diagram settings, bridge, lines, and paths. I'll just add in center lines because that will show up in a minute. And you can see there is our alignment with the transition points and then points. So, with this alignment defined, these elements selected, I can use the sculpt. The sculpt extrude option. To copy these cross members along the alignment. Note we can have multiple lines in the model. I have 30 increments at 3 meter centers. And I, and I use the cross members, but if I click on this option here, include beams along the extrusion, I create the bridge as a whole. Now, I want the members and cross members to be different. So let me just tie this up. At the moment we should have see property one going along, property two going across. So property one I'm going to make this T beams and I'm going to give it default concrete material for the moment. So I need to set up a proper concrete material. So depth, let's say, meter deep, flange, which nice grillage, three meter centers, so three meter wide flange. Flange is 300 mil deck, and then a 500 mil stem on that T section. And slab, again, concrete long term, a rectangular, 300 deep, three meters width. So this is now 
fully populated with sections. But as I mentioned, this standard concrete, I want to use a co-defined concrete. I'll go and define a concrete. If I just click on more, I'm saying there, make a concrete. And I'm going to use the co-base properties and let's have a 40-50 mix. Now, can take short-term loads, can take long-term loads. Uh, let's take short-term loads. I can then go and assign that material to those elements. Now, other element aspects. Um, the moment we've got T beams along the outer edges, which I don't really want, let me just reduce the filter down to just the edge elements, and I am going to select those edge elements. and make those dummy elements. Now these are dummies which means the the grid panels will still create um, but any load which falls onto the um, any load which falls onto the dummy elements will then shed onto point loads on the end of these slabs. Sorry apparently a bit quiet I shall move the microphone a bit closer and speak up a bit. Let me just check these grid panels on my labels and we can see excellent they're all grey nothing's red that's fine so everything should work all right if you get if you red panels that means they haven't they haven't um that they're not working correctly maybe got re entrant angles and so on let's close let's hide those ways so we have um properly set up we need supports so what we need is those end ones pinned but also I shall um pin this bridge at third points so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten So there we have our bridge supported and I'll add in some self-weight. Now self-weight normally most structures you just take minus one for everything. A grillage if it was equal elements in both directions you might say half the self-weight on both elements. In this particular case because the T sections contain everything anyway. I'm just going to take property one and leave that as a default. So I'm not getting any self weight on those slab elements, but the overall overall behavior will be, will be appropriate. We can always um, check local loads later on the slab in the detailed design. Just make sure that's working. Let me just run a static analysis. Isometric and say, yep, deflections, bending moments, and it looks like I missed a dummy an element. Right, let me just change that to a dummy. Done over there as well. Okay, that all 
seems to be working fine. So that's the basic bridge. Save that. And let's now move on to loading. Now, bridge load optimization. One of the most important aspects of bridge loading is called the influence line, which is the effects of a point, effects of a moving load on a particular location. And only that uh, location. Now, you need to pick and choose the points that you're interested in. So, um, yeah, choose the best points. Don't choose everything. You'll be, you'll get lots of um, load combinations anyway. But you just need to choose. Use your judgment to, to, to choose the worst spots. Now, these will produce many many low cases uh, and so you then need to envelope the results now you can you can have envelopes of some combinations you can envelope envelopes as well do watch out for that because if you have an envelope and the envelope of multiple envelopes the number of permutation the number of options can get quite large um, or indeed enveloping um, optional loads as well so if you have some combination with five one combination with six the total permutations is 30. if you have let's say 30 individual moving loads um the number of permutations there can be large too so um do watch out for that GSA has handled up to 500 million, so you should have enough headroom. That might take a little while to analyze. You can put modifiers onto the um, onto, onto the envelopes to get just a max and min and so on, but you will lose the coexistent effects when you're doing design and so on. Just to illustrate that. Top option, just combination there, envelope, but there's the max and there's a C min, and there's the absolute, you know, the largest values in the two directions. Ooh, ah. Now, I mentioned about audio, let me just check something. Testing, testing. Um, Right, hopefully the um, few people having hearing problems, uh, sorry, audio problems. Um, hopefully you can hear me generally okay. GSA Bridge Analysis. Now there are a number of guides out there. Um, there's a step-by-step -step guide in the help file, um, which goes through three methods. There are three methods which are the full optimization, lane-by-lane -lane optimization, and also direct placement of vehicles in the model. I'll look at these three in reverse order um, for reasons that will become apparent as we go through. You can also do analysis stages, okay, construction sequencing, which we'll look at if, if we have time. So, bridge load optimization. Let's take this existing bridge, and what we need to do is add in some lanes and the vehicles. lanes as in paths so let's have a, a path one and these can be lanes and footways and tracks and vehicles and so on let's take a lane which is on that road alignment and the offset from the alignment which is positive to the right as you look along the alignment one to four meters and you can see the lanes appeared there and then I'll do a path two which is also going to be a lane from four to seven. So these are these are paths of vehicles. The vehicles well there are a number of pre-supplied vehicles but I'm going to create a lorry. 
So we have the axle location, the wheel offset um, from that centre line of the vehicle, and the load on each tyre. And we can specify the width of the tyre um, to smear the load a little bit. I'll leave this zero, so it's just the point load. Now double um, wheels at the back, so offset slightly more, but again, same value. And then the front wheels, 4.5, so just two meter span there, and three five collisions on the load. Now let's take this vehicle on these paths, and I'm going to create some a moving bridge load. Two moving bridge loads. First one's going to be on path one. It's going to be a vehicle. Can do knife edge loads. Go from zero up to ninety at one meter sensors, and I'm going to choose to use the pre-supplied vehicles. Use my lorry, and then I'm going to have a second vehicle on the other path. Again, a lorry. And we will um, create the moving loads for this. Now, to do this, we use a bridge tool to expand the bridge loading. So, what this now gives us is a large number of point loads in various load cases. It's a bit easier to see if we actually activate them here. You can see there is our lorry load, and as we click through the various options, we can see the lorry moving one meter sensors. Let us run a static analysis which will analyze the dead load and all the individual bridge loads. We scale that, and you can see there is our bridge, and we can click through there. Um, and we can then envelope all these results down case and tasks and I can say envelope and I can add in my which I haven't given that a name yet and I can envelope then the self the self weight with Really mean. Got my factors completely back to the front. Shocking. Um, so I can take the dead load, or indeed the X of complication. We can say, um, or one times the dead load, and a multiplier on the live load. Then envelope this. And we can then see the, let just rescale that a bit. And look from the side. So we can see the, um, the envelope of the um, combination of the dead load plus the various lorry loads on that. So that's a very simple project. That's what we call method C. Well, let's look at method B. Let me just delete these out just to keep things tidy. Um, let's delete all of those. I should give this a name this time. And I'm going to use those lane, those paths, but I'm also going to add in another path which is going to be um, a rail track and rather than and the center of this is going to be eight meters of over stand the gauge and the, the factor um, 50 percent this just says the load is equally applied onto both both rails so it, it's a curved um, track but 
Let's take the train is moving sufficiently slow that it doesn't really throw itself around very much. The we now need to do rather than the moving bridge loads, we need path loads. So we set up the path loads, which aha. What we need to do is set up my this bridge specification, which I'm going to say is Eurocode loading. Then my path loads will be appropriate. That's on those. Path two. And the rail, I'll add in a train load. So we have loads set up for these three lanes. And we now need to do influence points. Now, as I mentioned, you, this bridge will require quite a few influence points, but I'm going to take, take the crucial points. Um, let's say venue moments, end of element 44. So influence beam effect one, which is going to be beam 44 at the start of that, and that's going to be, I'm just looking for the major axis moment on that. I'll also take the hogging moment on the supports I take at the start of element 97, so effect two, so a separate effect, so separate examination of the results or the influence lines and so on. And we would have multiple of these, but also have node effects, so Let's look at oops, worst reactions on this line here. And this time they will have all the same let's change it to force. I keep them the same effect, so they are considered together. So, the influence lines will look at maximum reactions on all three points simultaneously. To display these, we can look at now influence effects. And we can see that there is the influence effects maximum reactions at that point there, or we can go bridge options. Maximum moment there, or influence two, which is maximum moment there. I think we are ready to go. Let's create some. Let's do a new analysis task. Sorry, analysis, new analysis task. And I'm going to do a bridge optimization. And I'm just going to ask for influence analysis. You can jump through and do the full analysis here, but I'm going to do it step by step. So influence analysis. For the three parts, that's worked. And let's look at the influence line. So here we have the influence lines for the that maximum hogging moment. The second moment over there. And the reaction at that point. They all look fine to me. Now this is a graphical view in the outputs you can also get let's say nodal influence results so the actual detail or alternatively the details of the of the bulb so you can see from 
0 to 60. So the extent and largest values of those. So let's do an op let's do some loading on this. So let's optimize the path loading. So which will take the influence line effects, and this then creates a number of static bridge loads. If you want to minimize the, the amount of load cases to check, we can um, go into here and. S and see these all max and min, beam influence effects 2, beam influence effects 1, no influence. I can say I'm interested in the maximum reaction, so I can, for example, um, delete out the min nodal reactions. Unless, of course, we think we might get uplift, in which case we need to take, leave those in. Um, we can inspect the various other hogging and sagging moments and um, remove those appropriately. But let's leave those other ones. So what now what to do is expand these bridge loads into grid loads. Close those and we can see we now have so beam influence effect so this one will be maximizing that moment and we'll be minimizing that moment or maximizing the sag like the hog, minus hog, and looking at maximum reactions. Once we have that, we can do static analysis of everything, including the dead load. And then combine and em envelope that these as as before now third option option a which i have left will last because it is um the easiest let me just um actually if i just yeah Delete out all those grid area loads to keep things clear, and I'll change my paths. But before I do that, let me go to the bridge load specification. And and change it to an actual design, full design code now. So. Let's go for Eurocode, and we can choose the various code options. Obviously, this varies between design codes you're working to. And I'll now create from the path. I'm going to do a two-way carriage carriageway on the road alignment. So let's say it goes from one meter to seven meters, and I'm going to call it. Um, A foot way on the side, which is going from 7.2 to 8.5, and I go and switch the lines of path back on. We can see we have um, carriageway here. The lanes are undefined because the software will, will decide where the lanes go based on the width, and there's a footpath for pedestrian loadings on the edge there. Now, when we do analysis bridge loading, by default, it will want to do absolutely everything. And we just analyze that, and it goes away and does um, the influence lines, the bridge loads, and the expansions, and then the static loads. And give us a number of individual low cases, both of characteristic and um, 
combined loads which we can then envelope now um I mentioned about enveloping and sort of the manual approach to envelopes which is here in the combination cases what i'm going to do is something slightly more sophisticated in that um i'm going to imp okay we haven't need a separate static analysis for the permanent load we'll just do that quickly um a new analysis task now for bridge loads the automatic envelopes in the combination case can be quite slow so we can do analysis envelopes as an analysis task and this pre-calculates the values and we say a 15 plus a3 to a14 and we then say we're interested in vertical reactions and let's say all venue moments oh no let's just say maximum major axis moments just for the example and that then gives us low cases say maximum venue moments and minimum venue moments and so on so that's bridge loading in a nutshell obviously you're, you're, you need a few more influence points a few more load cases and so on but that is it in essence we have a number of other options in 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 GSA to help the bridge loads, buckling loads, for example, buckling loads are very good for um, plate girders, um, trusses, and so on. And the basic principle behind the buckling is that well, there's there's two choices. There's there's a linear buckling analysis, and this is used as the Euler method to calculate the the applied axial load that 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 makes the stiffness of the element go to become zero. Note that axial loads dominate the shear forces don't they have a minor influence but not very much. On the other hand if you do a non-linear buckling analysis which, which increments the loads up to failure the um, the shear loads can have quite a large effect on these. Um, and the end result of this is you get a, an actual deflection to load um, calculation whereas you know, with the linear buckle buckling there's no relationship between the load and, and the deflection it's just normalized to one meter it's calculating the shape but not the value um, and so you just get a straight line relationship if you do the elastic non-linear buckling analysis you usually find this uh, approaches it might actually reach the linear buckling analysis but it usually usually comes close um, to it and of course here the load and displacement are related and if you also add in material nonlinearity so plastic yielding of steelwork and so on then you usually find the low capacity is actually much lower than the linear buckling analysis uh, let's show you this in action now rather than this model which won't buckle to its nature I will open up a plate girder that I made earlier and you can see this plate girder is made up of um, two dimensional elements the um, shell elements I think my perspective is on let me switch the perspective off so we can see a bit cleaner Um, and the model currently has um, stiffness in there so, and we also have loads on the self weight and more importantly sort of a top flange load what I want to do is load up this beam with these loads and see what load it takes to induce buckling so there it's not now 
of course I also want to test it with and without the stiffness so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a, a stage on here by default the model includes everything so I'm going to do a stage which is no no stiffness stiffness and it's all not now it's property 4 for stiffness let me just check that yes which means all stages and stage without the stiffness you can see the state the stiffness are um, deactivated I then can do an analysis which is a modal buckling and I'll do it for the whole model um, let's call it width stiffness like I say one I'm up I mentioned in the first mode really. Um don't know what load cutoffs load one plus load two. If you do multiple modes, sometimes the modal analysis can produce um analysis with negative load factors. Um they're sort of theoretical tension bucklings which cause um is theoretical rather than real realistic so um, you can make the analysis ignore those those buckling cases I will also add in set them to the new um, I can solve option which is quicker than the old one Okay, that's solved. So let's look at these modes, and we can see we get a lateral torsional buckling mode there. Oh, let me switch off the deformation. Low factor of 2.5 and some of the other higher buckling modes. Now let's add in another analysis, which is modal buckling of without stiffness. I'll just take one. And so the buckling of this, turn those, you can see the buckling without the stiffness, low factor 1.2, which is getting quite tight, and with the stiffness, 2.5. So the stiffness are definitely. Um, helping the, the buckling capacity of this plate girder. Another option mentioned is pedestrian loading on on bridge. Now we had the um, sort of pathway load earlier, but footfall analysis is more about human-induced vibration on the bridge. Now, note that GSA at the moment only considers vertical vibration, not the Millennium Bridge style horizontal vibration. Uh, there are slightly different phenomena, um, and um, vertical vibration is normally a problem on light lo lo lightly loaded bridges. Um, horizontal vibration is more a problem on heavily loaded. Um, I can get you more details on that if you want. So vertical vibration, football vibration. Yeah, if you imagine the bridges of Singapore beam, you get various modes of vibration, and, and there's some of these steps on the beam or jumps on this and so on. You get an impact, which means you get vibrations which then die off, um, which have been damped by the inherent damping of 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 the system. Now the response of the structure to that those impact forces is not just dependent on on, on the frequencies, um, various modes, but also the um, the m modal mass of each of those because um, because we're looking for accelerations, accelerations is proportional 
to the force and the mass um, modes modes with low mass tend to exhibit high vibration high high accelerations and the output we get velocities and accelerations and accelerations can be measured in terms of response value and the response value is a comparison between the actual accelerations and the human perception limits for particular frequencies and you see people are most aware of vibrations between the 4 to 8 hertz range less so at other frequencies and um, thus R is a sort of a dimensionless multiplier on on this curve <coughs> generally bridges are usually about maybe 32 or 64 times the base curve so look at this in in practice again I'll grab a model I made earlier now this model looks very similar to the bridge that we made before but this time um, I have the bridge deck model, so the bridge, but as 2D elements because I find it gives slightly n nicer results. Right, so first thing we need to do is do a modal analysis. Now it looks similar to the buckle analysis, but this is a dynamic modal analysis. And I'm going to ask for, I don't know, 20 modes. And rather than the lower boundary, I'm going to ask the upper boundary because bridges tend to be low frequency structures, so we want modes up to about 15 hertz. So I'll ask for a cutoff value of 16 just to give us a little bit of clearance. Um, the self weight of the bridge is automatically included. We can include additional, um, say, deck loads and, and so on. Vertical vibration will leave off live loads altogether to give us a worst case. I'll analyze that and we then get a number of vibration modes which if I add in the um, displacement contouring we can see we get the various vibration modes and these run up actually we ask for 20 modes we this up to 19 um, because I'm thinking the mode 20 would have been um, above 16 Hertz so we've got up to 15 Hertz which is sufficient let us now do a second analysis a dynamic response for the footfall and let's take the full excitation on this set the damping value appropriately the station methods the walking speeds and examine the results so deflections off and look at the nodal results on there and we can see we're getting a response of about 12 which is way below our target for 32 it's a concrete road bridge so this it's a to be expected, I suppose, that a road bridge won't have much of a footfall problem. You get the lighter weight footbridges and they are much more susceptible to the footfall vibration. We can also get additional details such as um, accelerations, um, what the critical frequencies are for particular areas, um, velocities off the deck and so on. Now, we can go into a lot more detail on football, but which will, um, as time is running short, we'll leave it there. And we'll just look at a few examples where GSA has been used for bridging bridges of various sizes around the world. Here's one by uh, Price and Myers, a stainless steel stressed skin footbridge down in Bristol. Won the Istrakti Pedestrian Bridges Award in 2010. 
Catwick Air Bridge, um, two and a half thousand ton pedestrian bridge, uh, which because of its location directly over a, um, I guess a runway, a taxiway, had to be built off site and then installed in position um, during an overnight clearance. Other extreme to that, a bamboo bridge in uh, San Francisco, or sorry, Los Angeles. Uh, there's nothing to stop you creating your own materials and um, creating the bridges. Nice little footbridge over in Ireland. A road bridge, this is uh, just outside the Olympic Park for vehicle access to the Olympics. Uh, over the uh, over the railway, rather curious bridge down in Australia, the Web Bridge, the Footbridge, Kurilpa Bridge, which is a tensegrity bridge in in Brisbane. Uh, so you have cable supporting flying struts, supporting cable supporting the bridge, uh, and so on. Uh, 2010 Australia Steel Institute Queensland Award and joint winner for the Australian Engineering Excellence Award. We also have Infinity Footbridge, uh, Ice Truck T um, Supreme Award in 2009 for Expedition Engineering, longest footbridge in the UK. And another road bridge, fourth replacement, which is under design at the moment, so obviously um, architect's imp impression rather than photographs just yet. What, so what's next? For those of us, for those of you who aren't um, u using GSA, uh, you can download a, load a free trial from the Oasis w w website. There's information in the help file and the manual. We'll put these models on on the w webinar page for you. Try the step by step examples. There's a YouTube channel. Uh, we've been recording this webinar. Uh, and I'll send you a link to that over the next day or two. There are more webin webinars to come. Keep an eye out for those. And any questions, give us a ring. Send in the emails. Uh, look in the web website and the FAQs. Well, uh, thanks everyone. And um, hopefully you can see that uh, we have quite a significant product offering uh, to be used when analyzing and designing bridges. And if you need uh, further information, you can contact uh, myself or Peter on the email addresses shown on slide here. And uh, please also check our website to find when our next webinar will take place. Yeah, as, as Peter mentioned, there are some recorded webinars on our website and also on our YouTube channel. So you can, you can review those webinars as well. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. This webinar has now finished. Thank you.